Hey what's up guys, it's Mike with Alpha Reptile back with another video today and today we're going to be discussing the best beginner dart frogs for you guys. I'm here with Lucas from Jungle Jewel Exotics. You guys have seen the, the, the dart frog room tour so now we're going to be discussing the best beginner dart frog. I know you guys were looking forward to something like this and I think it'll be an interesting conversation. So right at the beginning of the video we're actually going to talk about general husbandry and just some general care guidelines and then after that we're going to have our discussion about just general dart frog keeping and some different tips and tricks that I mean you've been in the hobby for how long? Uh, you know what I'm actually believe it or not a relative newcomer. Um, we started breeding frogs in 2012. Oh okay. Yeah so. Yeah. Newer. Newer. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been keeping frogs for probably four or five years so I got some experience. You guys got obviously quite a bit of experience yeah. as well so right now we're just going to talk about general husbandry. So I guess first thing we have to say is and what do they need? Yeah. You know, what, what size of enclosure do they does yeah. a, uh, a dart frog need? Yeah. And that's going to depend on what species you go with. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at your errata species, your leucamellas, and your tinctura species, really the minimum size enclosure should be an uh, 18 by 18 uh, square footprint, um, and then you can give them a little bit of height, and they will appreciate that. So an 1818 cube or an 181824 is great, and of course bigger is better. Uh, you can use a temporary housing of a 10 gallon tank and there are some breeders that will, will keep pairs in a 10 gallon, uh, but for the longevity and, and the best enrichment for the animals, uh, these, these animals live in the jungle, so bigger is better. Yeah. Um, the smaller species, like your Ranatomeas, um, those guys you can keep a pair of actually quite happy in a 12-12-18, um, but if you can get them into an 18-18-24, even better. Yeah. Um, a lot of these frogs uh, are actually quite territorial, especially the females. Um, so how many can you keep together? The typical answer would be two to three. However, some species you can keep communally. Your uh, Leucamella species in an 18 cube, I'll keep four up to five, depending on their uh, personalities. Uh, tinctura species, two to three, um, and for the smaller Ranatomeas that are somewhat communal, so your uh, Variabilis, uh, some of our Summer's Eye, uh, we'll keep four or five uh, in that size tank as well. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different options, but if you're looking for just as kind of a, a general guideline, any of the larger frogs are basically going to need an 18-18-24 just a general recommendation provide more you could even do a 24 18 18 that also works as well uh, in general the smallest i would go you'll see them often called thumbnail dart frogs are is a 12 by 12 by 18 keep in mind though that is also greatly reduced when you add like the custom backgrounds and stuff so if you can provide a little bit bigger that's ideal it's not necessary but uh, that's kind of what I would say. Yeah. I guess the next thing to talk about is temperature. That's kind of one of the big things in dart frogs. For temperatures, it's typically a normal room temperature, you know, sitting around that uh, 70 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, 20 to 23 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, basic rule of thumb, if you're comfortable, the frogs are comfortable. They are a cold-blooded animal and they can handle slightly cooler temperatures uh, down to 18 degrees Celsius or down to about 68 Fahrenheit. Um, you don't want to go too hot though. There is some uh, conflicting information about how hot you can go. Um, if your home is sitting at about, you know, getting into those 80s degrees, so about 26 degrees Celsius, um, that's about that. You know, the, the frogs are going to do just fine. Once you start getting to the 30 degrees Celsius or 90 degree Fahrenheit, yeah. now you can start run, run, running into problems. And if you're in a state or a province that has uh, really high temperatures for heat waves, you're, we're talking uh, getting into, you know, 38 degrees Celsius or uh, 104 Fahrenheit. Um, that's it's gonna be a, a tough go for the for these very fragile little animals yeah with without climate control if you guys have AC and keep it at 75 degrees perfect that's totally cool. <laughs> that's great yeah. so that's basically temperatures they're really they don't need heat uh, and I mean even the LEDs and stuff like that if they're right above the tank they will provide a certain amount of heat so keep that in mind when you're setting up your tank um, but beyond that I think a, an important part of keeping frogs is feeding them. Yeah, um, so dart frogs, uh, they have to eat live prey and in captivity we feed them uh, flightless or wingless fruit flies. So these are uh, fruit flies that have been used in laboratories around the world. Uh, if you guys are wondering how to culture flies, there'll be a link in one of the two top corners here. I just made a video a couple days ago about how to culture flies. In there I show you the differences of the two different kind of flies that are typically used in the hobby and 
that's all the information that you need there. So we won't go too much into it now, but uh, just keep in mind that you will be providing live food for them. Uh, for the Phyllobates and for some of the larger dart frogs, you can feed like one or two week crickets. That's fine for them. Um, but for the vast majority of frogs, you're going to be feeding fruit flies. So that's something to keep in mind is you can either buy them from a place like you guys or you can culture them yourselves. It's up to you. Yep. And, and makes, making a basic uh, fruit fly media um, mixture like what you have in the other video uh, is certainly one way of doing it and keeping the cost down. There are commercially available dry medias that you can yeah. buy. Um, and, and there's actually, uh, in, in the dart frog community, there's a lot of individuals out there right now working to make even better fruit fly yeah. medias and there's some pretty cool stuff on the horizon. So the fruit flies themselves are not actually a, um, a, a whole diet for the frog. You do need to be dusting them with a good vitamin supplement uh, and there are several out there but uh, the one I've had the most success with has been Dendrocare because that's been an, an all-in-one uh, vitamin mineral supplement including some of the harder uh, vitamins to work with like vitamin E and vitamin A. Yeah. And vitamin A is one of those essential things that a dart frog needs for a healthy life. Problem being is if you overdose just too much of the dust, it could actually kill the frogs. I know another really common one that you can find at pretty much any pet store is the Rapashi Calcium Plus. Um, a lot of that is used all over. I use kind of a mixture of different products myself. I use a lot of Arcadia products, whether it's the Calcium and Magnesium or the Earth Pro A. And then every couple feedings, like three times a month or so, I'll use the Rapashi Calcium Plus. So there's a lot of different dusting schedules out there. I do recommend dusting though. I know there are some people in the hobby that don't dust. Uh, and I, I, You know, and an why? example of that would be <laughs> that I can eat burgers and fries for the rest of my life. Yeah. How long am I gonna live, yeah, right? And exactly. you can feed just fruit flies to your, to, your dart, to your dart frogs. And if you get three to five years, if, if you're happy with that, that's, it's unfortunate for the frog though. Any captive species of animal requires that we, the caregiver, give them the best nutrition and the best care that we can possibly do for them. And I think the last part that I want to cover in, in this kind of general captive husbandry is vivariums. That's something that there's a ton of different posts on, there's builds, I have some. I'll be posting a whole series about the different like ins and outs of building a vivarium from backgrounds to substrate mixes to uh, the actual plant selection as well as lighting. So there is a lot of information out there, but I think that, well, I know that that is my favorite part of the hobby. Uh, getting into dart frogs kind of got me into different live plants and stuff, and you move from putting like pothos and stuff like that into your tank to moving and buying $40 bromeliads or uh, like orchids and stuff like that. You certainly can get into it and spend a lot of money on plants, but it really gives you an appreciation for nature and trying to recreate something naturalistic whether or not it's bioactive, that's up to you. Uh, I personally like bioactive, but I know that's kind of like a flash term that's being used everywhere nowadays. Well, and, and actually we should cover that is, uh, you know, bioactive vivar vivariums and naturalistic vivariums. Yeah. And I think this is what got a lot of the internet uh, just in a buzz right now about the whole bioactive community. Yeah. Um, naturalistic vivariums are gonna be anything with uh, live plants in it, and, uh, and that's pretty much it. Yep. Right? Just make it look as natural as possible. Yep. Once you start getting into the bioactive, what well, that means is now you're adding um, other critters into the environment that are going to help uh, break down the biomass. So eat the poop, break down uh, any of the decaying and dying plants. So that's going to be your springtails and isopods are the ones that are commonly uh, available. But you can even find some worms to do that. You know, mm -hmm. white worms are great for it. Uh, red wiggler earthworms can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even start getting into these small, small microbes as well. Um, and there's a few different ways that you can introduce those, but even just having the animals poop in the enclosure is going to help uh, adding the microbes, and over time, that tank is just going to become bioactive. You just won't have any of the big, or the bigger species, you know, your, yeah. <laughs> your isopods and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times you'll find, uh, in most of my tanks, I'll seed it with springtails, and then over time, I know on my, I think it was my reptile room tour this month, uh, if you guys look on the Geomita spangleri on the turtles that I have, there's little bugs walking all over them. That some people are freaking out that there are mites. Uh. They are not mites. They're just like different beneficial thrips and stuff that lives in the soil. Um, I don't think there's any springtails there, but there's a bunch of different invertebrates that live and recycle, provide nutrients to the plants. That's what bioactive is. So it, yeah, that's. 
you can keep them either way, um, but I do definitely recommend live plants for dart frogs. Yep. Um, I know there's some people that don't like leaf litter, there's some people that like leaf litter. I'm of the leaf litter gang, I love providing, I also like the way it looks, it just looks nice. Well in the jungle there's lots of leaf yeah. litter everywhere and that's just where these yeah. animals are hiding. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of having uh, leaf litter in in your living vivarium as well. Yeah. Uh, it helps keep them off of the, the dirt, the, the substrate. Yeah. Um, it's, it keeps the tank cleaner, it keeps the animals cleaner as well, and it gives them a little bit of enrichment as they're foraging for isopods and springtails uh, in the tank. Yeah. So they're constantly feeding, constantly eating. Oh yeah, they're, they're always looking for something. So, I think that's gonna do it. I think do so. you have any other thoughts? I think we yeah. covered pretty much everything. Uh, you know, like with any other animal or anything else that you want to get into, research is key, so there's lots of good information and a lot of bad information on the internet. What I recommend is for folks to go online, check out you know, no less than five care sheets on how to keep these animals, and pick the best information. Not the information you think is the best, but the best information. Yeah. Like, don't just pick and choose. Everybody has different experience with these. A lot of the people that are writing this aren't looking at scientific papers documenting where they were found, what the temperatures were, and how the species was described. A lot of it is just, I kept in an 18, 18, 24 tank, they lived. Yep. Great. <laughs> and, and you know what, with these animals there's multiple ways that you can keep them. Um, you might find five different care sheets and those are the five different ways that these animals can be kept and they can yep. all be 100% correct. Mm -hmm. But you might have to make slight tweaks to where you're located. Yep and what's available in your area. Yeah, and talk to locals. There'll be Facebook groups and, and reptile stores or places that sell dart frogs as well, probably local to you. And talking to them and hearing their experience is definitely a good idea. With that being said, you guys have heard the general husbandry for dart frogs. Now I'll send you into the kind of discussion Lucas and I had on different things like wild caught and uh, different temperatures of houses and stuff like that. Uh, you guys can enjoy that and we'll catch you at the end of the video. When somebody asks me, Lucas, what is uh, the best dart frog I should begin with? I'm actually gonna respond with, what is the one that you're gonna be the most passionate about for the next decade to two, uh, to two decades? Uh, because these animals live actually a lot longer than you would think. Uh, 10 to 20 years is absolutely a normal life expectancy inside the vivarium uh, for a tinctura species or even some of the errata species. Um, so what we don't want is you to get a species and then be bored with this animal in two to three years, right? This isn't a gerbil yeah. or, or something like that. Some of the dart frogs that are commonly available for beginner species would be most of your tinctura species like your uh, erratus, uh, sorry, uh, your azurus or citronellas um, and then even uh, leucamellas is another common uh, species of dart frog that a lot of uh, people jump into and the reason for that is that they breed very readily in captivity. They've been around for a long time and yeah. the azurus was one of the very first dart frogs I kept in captivity uh, probably about 30 years ago now. I yeah, think I think there's there's some of that I saw the oldest pair was like 26 years old and it's still producing. So yeah. like Lucas said in the beginning, these are definitely a a all-time pet. Like these are gonna last as long as most snakes and stuff like that. This isn't one of those hamsters or gerbils or some of the other animals that'll live maybe five or six years, but it, you're gonna be getting 20 plus years out of these guys if you're caring for them properly. And that's kind of why we're here to discuss what is the best option, like Lucas said, so you can pick something that you're gonna to want to look after. And I think something's to be said, not only is it the, the species that you're gonna pick, as Lucas mentioned already, that there's going to be kind of the big three. There's the Leucamella, so the bumblebee dart frogs, Tinctorius, which are the I guess the Dying's Dart Frog, I yeah, think is the common name. Yeah, Dying Dart names. Frogs, yeah, so the Azurus. Yeah, and then there's the Erotus, which are, is there a common name for them? No. Not that I know, yeah. <laughs> um, so they are kind of the top three that are most widely available, I suppose. The part that I like most about the hobby and that kind of stuff, and a lot of people will get into it eventually, is the tanks. Um, the tanks is really what's going to keep you in it. If you're going to buy dart frogs to keep them in little tiny bins with maybe a light over them, maybe not, what's the point, right. honestly? <laughs> uh, I know if you're like a breeding facility, I know Josh's frogs and stuff like that will have little 10 gallon tanks with glass lids and they don't really care. Um, but as a hobbyist, the, the fun in dart frog keeping is as much about the frogs as it is about the tank. So there's a couple different factors that you need to consider before getting dart frogs. 
And then once you get dart frogs, it's really more or less the same care. There's not a whole lot of differences. Pumilio and stuff like that benefit from UV exposure. It's not necessary, but a lot of the frogs here and a lot, all my frogs at home, I don't give any UV exposure to. Well, and even walking through the jungles, I was fortunate enough to go down to Peru and, and check out these species in their native habitat. And they're living in, you know, sheltered parts of the, the rainforest where there's a heavy, dense uh, canopy. So not much light is coming through, but there is something to be said about having yeah. a, a very low wattage of UVB over top of the frogs. It, it certainly yeah. doesn't harm them no. uh, in a low dosage, but uh, it, like I said, it's not necessary, which means now you're not dealing with new light bulbs every six months. Yeah. Um, because uh, they're being kept at around that 73 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, that's that's normal room temperature, yep. right? Uh, so basic rule of thumb, if you're comfortable in the room just wearing you know, a t-shirt and you know shorts or jeans, yep. the frogs are gonna be comfortable. If it's going into a basement where the temperatures are dipping below 68, uh, or 18 degrees Celsius, then you, you might want to throw a small heat pack just on the on the back of the tank, just as a backup. Yeah. Uh, especially for the winter months, you know, when we get into Canada here, and it gets <laughs> pretty cool even inside the home here. But yeah. uh, you, we've all got furnaces, so yeah. uh, we keep the temperature at a relative, you know, 71 degrees, and mm -hmm. you know, everybody's comfortable. Yeah, and I mean, something I know when I first got into it, and I know I've gotten some questions from you guys that it, it becomes a question of people get really bent up on the temperatures and it getting too hot. I, I won't lie, my Tinctorius that I have, their tank reaches upwards of like 83 degrees or 20. It's about 25, 26, yeah. somewhere around there. And you wouldn't want to get too much hotter than exactly, that, right? Yeah. Once you're getting into the 30s or you're yeah. starting into the 90 degrees, yeah. uh, that can be detrimental to the frogs. Yeah. Um, what will happen is they will try to bury themselves into the substrate, yeah, exactly. find a cool dark corner to hide in. Yeah. Um, on those really, really hot days or if you're in the hot states, uh, turning off the lights during the day, um, having for the big heat waves, if you have that in your local area, uh, I like to keep a, a half a bottle of, uh, like a half two liter bottle of Coke, um, but just put water into it and freeze that, keep it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And if it gets really, really hot, I can always throw that into the Viv to help cool it down for a short period of time. Yeah. But it's a Band-Aid solution. Yeah, yeah, it's not gonna be something that's gonna, it's not gonna fix all of your problems. Ideally, if you're in some of the hotter states, Florida, Phoenix, that kind of stuff, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that don't have AC there, but AC is pretty common in those states. So most of the time they'll be able to climate control your room and your area to a certain degree, whether it's a, a unit AC unit just in the basement just to cool it off or whatever you have available. That is possible, but that's something that a lot of people I've noticed get really bent out of shape about. Like, oh, my room gets to 80 degrees. And it's like, okay, I mean, that's warmer and you'll definitely want to keep an eye on them but it's not like instant dead. No. Especially at the captive breeding that we're at now. If you had wild caught, maybe that probably wouldn't go so well based on the captive breeding that, that is done in, in the hobby now. Uh, it's gonna be something that I, I guess weeded out. In some of the harder parts, uh, they'll be more acclimatized to the local, to local condition. Something that is nice, is most dart frogs in the hobby now are captive bred, so you don't have to worry too much about wild caught. Um, typically, most of the times that people bring in wild caught animals, they they know it and they advertise it as an import export type deal, so you kind of understand that you're getting wild caught animals. But there's something to be said for wild caught. Um, if you're looking to to get started in the hobby as a first animal, whether it's a reptile or an amphibian. Wild cut's definitely not the way you want to go. No, and wherever possible, you know, try to support captive breeding programs. Go to your local reptile expos. You know, a lot of uh, cities and states will have one or several uh, a year. Start doing a Google search. In Canada, there's two major breeders uh, in Canada. Yep. In in the states, there's uh, there's a lot. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. And some of the big boys like Josh's frogs, you know, they've got mm -hmm. a lot of different frogs out there. You can you can certainly find captive bred frogs, and and that goes for a lot of the reptiles and other amphibians. There's a lot of captive breeding programs. Uh, if you're starting to look for some of those rare ones that are only found in uh, in the wild, and you're a beginner, maybe select a different animal and get some experience first before you go into wild caught. Yeah, and some that'll kind of prevent that as well is typically the really high costs associated with those animals, like. There's dart frogs out there that'll cost you upwards of three, four thousand dollars per frog, Canadian at least. Yeah. Um, but even imports from places like Colombia and stuff like that, they are 
they're not cheap frogs. If you have that money to blow, I would say don't. I would say spend that on a really nice setup and then get some nice beginner frogs um, rather than buying $4,500 frogs and just kind of being like, oh, they're here, what do I do? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you also want to check your local uh, bylaws as well with fish yeah. and wildlife. Um, you know, some, some species like the, the phyllobates, uh, they're, they're actually illegal in a lot of provinces and states. Um, so you might be able to get them, but you shouldn't be getting them. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, Although, <laughs> that being said, I mean, is there anything wrong with keeping them? They're beautiful animals and no, they don't pose any danger. No, yeah, exactly. Not the captive ones, the, no. the ones fresh, imported. <laughs> I don't want to go licking them or rubbing them in cuts. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Facebook groups that will have people that have frogs for sale. Now, technically, you can't be like, frogs for sale, but you can post pictures and if people are interested in them, it's really common to just shoot that person a message and say, hey, look, like I want this frog. Is it for sale? And I know that there's a lot of places on Facebook. Um, there's also, if you're in Canada, there's the reptileclassifieds.ca. Um, there's a bunch of different options to find local breeders or even just hobbyists that might have one or two tanks and happen to breed them. So that's definitely somewhere to check out as well. Uh, whether I know there's some people that don't like supporting Josh's frogs and stuff like that. So if you're looking for other options, there are other options. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you guys all very much for watching. This was probably a pretty long video for everyone. Uh, I hope you guys learned something and I definitely had a pleasure talking with you about different dart frogs and stuff like that. Always a pleasure. Everybody has their own opinions about how to keep them better, for worse, whatever, but those are just kind of some general rules that you guys should stick to. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you smash that like button. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, leave them in the comment section. Make sure you click that subscribe button for more May Madness and more dark frog, reptile, fish. Uh, make sure that you hit that like button down below and you can also follow my page as well on Facebook and Instagram at Jungle Jewel Exotics and of course our website www.junglejewelexotics.com. Perfect, sweet. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I know that you guys enjoy the tours and enjoy the discussions. So we'll catch you in the next one, guys. Later. Bye.